Lenora, this would be a lot easier if I was in the cart and you were pushing it. No! I twisted my ankle last time on those damn roller skates. Oh yeah, I forgot. But watch your cigarette, Carl! Oh, sorry. Welcome to Midnight Rental. It's after midnight here at Midnight Rental, and you know what that means. We're closed. And with Halloween fast approaching, we're a little bit behind on our decorating. Oh, Midnight Rental. Hey, do you guys buy VHS tapes? Well, we're closed, but if you bring them by tomorrow, we can take a look at them. Can't I just tell you what I have over the phone? Mm, well, we kind of have to see them in person before we can give you a quote. I got a copy of Twister. Mm, that's not really a rare tape. But did I mention it's sealed? Sealed tapes go for a lot on eBay. So sell them on eBay. But I don't want to do all that work. Let me just bring them by. We're closed. Well, you're obviously there. Why'd you pick up the phone? In case Paul Rudd calls. A lot of people ask us where we get our inventory, and with the price of tapes currently skyrocketing, it's just really fortunate that I never throw anything away. Trying to replace all of these would be astronomical, though I am still mourning a box of horror VHS tapes that I misplaced in college. And trying to reacquire them one by one through eBay would be time consuming and extremely expensive. But if you're on a budget and thrifty like me, you can go to different Goodwills or garage sales, and eventually find what you're looking for. Why, this entire stack of Halloween movies we found at a Salvation Army for only $8. And it's fortunate that we did, because tonight, the man that we're going to talk about is responsible entirely for this very tape stack. I am, of course, talking about John Carpenter. One of my favorite directors and composers of all time, John Carpenter is responsible for far too many incredible films to cover in one single episode. He is, of course, best known for his role in creating the original Halloween movie. And don't worry, we're going to take a deep dive into the Halloween movie and the entire series as a whole, where it started, where it's gone, and where it's wound up. But he is so much more than one singular movie, and tonight we're going to talk about a few of my favorites. Hey, it sounds like you're talking about John Carpenter. He made one of my favorite movies, They Live. Do you know it? <laughs> Do I know it? I live it. Uh, going someplace? Look at you. She's got you spinning your wheel. Mom! Time. Be finicky. You'll never see me run without a good reason. It's nine lives fisherman stew. Nine lives? That's the best reason of all. See you around, sport. How do you tempt a finicky cat? With quality ingredients, wholesome and nutritious, from nine lives. Nine lives? I'd run around the world for you. Friday. Go ahead. Make my day. You're the disease. I'm the cure. May the force be with you. Sledgehammer. Then, on the streets, they're deadly. I'm a police officer. At home, they're just a couple of guys. I think it's time to go to your apartment. <laughs> Check. Sidekicks, right after Sledgehammer. Tomorrow. They Live, released in 1988 by Universal Pictures. Set in Los Angeles, the film opens with a drifter, played by wrestling star Rowdy Roddy Piper, passing through town looking for employment. Now, something I'm going to point out right away to avoid confusion is the drifter that Roddy Piper plays is never given a name during the film. But in the credits, he's listed as Nada, as the film is based on the short story Eight O'Clock in the Morning by Ray Nelson. The main character in the short story is named George Nada, so for clarity's sake, I'll be referring to the drifter in They Live as Nada in my synopsis 
just as it's listed in the film credits. Still with me? Great. Nada hits a crowded unemployment office with no luck and soon comes across a construction site and secures some work. Now, let's take a minute to appreciate the piper with the shirt off, shall we? He meets Frank, played by the legendary Keith David, who is no stranger to the Carpenter universe, having also starred in The Thing as Childs. Frank lets Nada know of a commune nearby that has hot food and showers and welcomes transients. He introduces Nada to Gilbert, one of the commune heads. We learn Frank is out in L.A. due to the steel mills closing up back in Detroit where his wife and kids still are. As night falls, Nada notices a group of people watching a TV whose signal gets interrupted by what looks like a public access broadcast that's warning those watching that they are being lulled into complacency while they intend to rule while everyone else stays unconscious. They are safe as long as they are not discovered. As the broadcast cuts back out, Nada notices Gilbert leading a blind pastor to the on-site church. The next morning, a broadcast again interrupts Cable 54 programming. Nada's curiosity finally gets the best of him, and he enters the church, where he finds that all of the gospel singing is actually coming from giant speakers. We learn that the hacked broadcasts interrupting the airwaves are actually being broadcast from right there. The call is coming from inside the house. Frank warns Nada to leave it alone, but when has anyone ever listened to that advice? That evening, in what feels like what potentially inspired Giuliani when he quote-unquote cleaned up the city, the commune gets raided by police, helicopters, and bulldozers as it's completely razed. The following day, Nada goes back inside the church and recovers a box hidden in the walls and takes it to the safety of an alley where he discovers it's filled with dozens of pairs of black sunglasses. He then decides the best place to conceal it would be in a trash can. Not sure what he thought the odds were of that being the safest place, but who am I to question Roddy Piper's judgment? As he walks down the street in one of the most classic scenes of the film, Nada puts on a pair of sunglasses he held onto and for the first time sees the world exactly how it is. Propaganda graces every billboard and printed advertisement, even money. And most notable, people are grotesque ghouls without lips and exposed teeth and giant spherical looking eyes without lids. Now, some people remain normal and human-like, but there's more than there isn't of these frightening creatures. The messages that replaced all advertisements are just straightforward, one to two word blunt commands that escalate the unease in the scene. Horrified while simultaneously fascinated, Nada can't look away at the peek behind the curtain he's now getting. But as he gets into a confrontation with one of the creatures... You look like your head fell on the cheese dip back in 1957. Oh. You see, I take these glasses off. She looks like a regular person, doesn't she, huh? Put them back on, formaldehyde face! She speaks into her wristwatch, and instantly, every creature in the store is onto him. He hightails it out of there, but unfortunately doesn't make it too far, but he manages to shoot them and get their guns. Now donning what is most certainly his signature look in the movie, Nada inadvertently walks into a bank and realizes he looks like a robber, so he does what anyone would do, and decides to just shoot up the joint once a security guard fires at him. But not before uttering one of the most and best repeated lines in cinematic history. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. And then followed by... And I'm all out of bubblegum. Almost as a glimpse into the future, we see he's even being tracked by a mechanical drone. Not nice! A chance meeting in a parking garage as he's trying to escape introduces us to his carjacking victim, Holly Thompson, played by the striking Meg Foster and her insanely beautiful eyes. They make it to her apartment where she tells him she's employed by Cable 54. He tries in vain to get her to just put the sunglasses on so she'll believe him, but she knocks him in the head with a wine bottle straight out of her living room window, leaving the sunglasses behind in the process. Dazed, Nada makes it back to the construction site where he tries to convince Frank of everything that he's seen, but Frank wants nothing to do with him. No, you ain't showing me nothing! And he's not buying it. As Nada returns to the alley to retrieve the very important box of sunglasses he hid in a trash can, he discovers, surprise, surprise, it's garbage day. Garbage day! Huh? No! 
in a completely preventable scenario, he somehow winds up in the back of the garbage truck and narrowly misses getting compressed, but not before grabbing one more pair of sunglasses. When Frank shows up in the alley to offer him some of his pay to help him get on the run out of sympathy and still refuses to put the sunglasses on, what happens next is truly another piece of cinematic history when Frank and Nada get into a five and a half minute fight. Five and a half minutes! After Nada finally gets the glasses on Frank's face, he sees the light. Or more so the aliens and the propaganda and all the other stuff. This reshapes their dynamic for the rest of the film going forward, and they become an inseparable buddy team. Gilbert finds Frank and realizes he can see too and gives him a heads up where they're meeting now. The secret society of sunglass wearers informs them that the signal coming from Cable 54 is what needs to be interrupted to wake everyone up. So they give everyone contact lenses that will enable them to see without being obvious and having to wear the sunglasses. Nada is overjoyed to find that among the crowd of seers, Holly is there, who had come to her senses after she put on his left-behind sunglasses. As they're going over logistics on how to interrupt the signal, the building gets raided, and without warning, the police just start shooting everyone. Miraculously, Frank and Nada escape through a portal and find themselves in a service tunnel beneath the city, and they make their way towards a massive ballroom where a big fancy to-do is taking place. It almost feels like a scene from the movie Society. They spot their former commune friend, previously a total ragamuffin with all of the dirt stains to match, Blow it out your ass. and now he's in a full tuxedo. They realize he's been converted to one of the high society goons, and since he assumes that they have been too, he shows them the transport room that can shoot commuters off to Andromeda in a matter of seconds. When they ask if they can get access to the main room, a shootout occurs, and they make their way through the station, ultimately trying to get access to the roof so they can destroy the signal. There's more yelling, screaming, running, shooting, and they eventually find Holly, who apparently not only had time for a wardrobe change, but also a visit to hair and makeup post-raid. And as the trio makes their way through the stairwell, Holly pulls out a gun and shoots Frank in the head! Now, the first time I saw this, it genuinely made me gasp out loud. I did not see it coming, and I was totally rooting for Frank the entire movie. As the helicopters are closing in, he pulls a gun from his sleeve and shoots Holly. And then, finally, the giant satellite dish, destroying the signal that had been broadcasting the subliminal propaganda to millions and unmasking all of the Cretans who live among the population. Nada is taken out in a hail of bullets as a true American hero. There's a quick closing montage of regular people reacting to the true identities of what were formerly normal-looking people surrounding them, and honestly, it's hilarious. Hey, what's wrong, baby? To the casual viewer, They Live might seem like a simple or even mildly comical movie at a surface glance, but it is so much more than that. Throughout the entire film, a societal commentary is running through it, And though it was made in 1988, it damn near feels like a documentary now. As I said before, the movie was loosely based on a short story, 8 o'clock in the morning, by Ray Nelson, which was first published in the November issue of the Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction in 1963. Carpenter, however, first came across it in a comic book adaptation of it, titled Nada, 20 years later in an issue of Alien Encounters. The character in the story was named George Nada. Carpenter's version follows it fairly closely. However, the addition of the sunglasses was all his. Carpenter has said in many interviews that he created They Live as a reaction to the Reaganomics capitalism that was happening in America and his complete disdain for it. John Carpenter is listed as the director of the film, while Fred Armitage is listed as the screenwriter. But in fact, that's just a pseudonym John Carpenter used as he wrote the entire screenplay himself. He said that it was due to the fact that he didn't want his name over everything. A movie by John Carpenter, directed by John Carpenter, with music composed by John Carpenter. Such a modest king we have. And speaking of music, right off the bat from the first opening frame, we're greeted with a plodding, occasionally twanging tempo that sets the uneasy tonality of the film. The score of the film was composed and performed by John Carpenter and Alan Howarth, 
It has that steady, telltale Carpenter beat. In casting the role of Nada, John Carpenter, a huge wrestling fan, chose Roddy Piper after watching him live during WrestleMania 3 and being introduced to him after the show. He wanted a rugged, blue-collar worker type, and Piper fit the look to a T. <laughs> you know, Roderick George Toombs was born in 1954 in Saskatoon, Canada. He had a hard childhood, getting moved from house to house a lot. His dad was a cop but not the Barney Miller type. He was more akin to a drunk with a badge. Roderick went out on his own as a young teenager, and he never looked back. He lived in youth hostels, getting odd jobs, some of which were helping wrestlers train for the big fight. He learned to play the bagpipes as a kid and used it to create the wrestler known as Rowdy Roddy Piper. And he was good at what he did making a name for himself in the wrestling world. I'm sure Lenora talked about his acting career already. But did you know he was in Highland, a TV show as an immortal? And always sunny in Philly as the maniac. He died in 2015 of a heart attack. You will be missed, Mr. Piper. Also, did you know John Carpenter directed Halloween? Yes, yes I did. Anyway, mm, I'm getting a vision that John Carpenter was the writer and director. Is that vision listed on the back of a movie box? Oh my God, you can read minds too? Jesus Christ, Emmy. Anyway, he loved Roddy's toughness and physicality, and he also had the ability to not only carry his role with a consistent, quiet strength, but also possessed the ability to deliver some wonderfully hilarious lines. Brother, life's a bitch. She's back in heat. Keith David was a no-brainer given that his size matched Piper's, and he also had previously worked with Carpenter on The Thing. Keith David is one of the most prolific actors of our time. He's had over 300 film and television roles and was most recently in the Jordan Peele film, Nope. With his rich, dulcet vocal tones, it's also no surprise that he's a jazz singer. During the unforgettable fight scene between Nada and Frank, it was originally only supposed to be 20 seconds, but wound up topping out at nearly five and a half minutes due to stunt coordinator Jeff Amato wanting to use every bit of Roddy that he could especially since he was paired with a near equally sized match in Keith David. This guy, this guy hits like a mule. After they had kind of beaten each other silly, they became real, real close friends, and they would share ideas back and forth. Roddy's great. I mean, he, I mean, he teaches me about this stuff, you know, reactions, you know, how you get punched, you know, when you get punched and when you get hurt, you know. <laughs> They spent nearly four weeks rehearsing, nailing down every single beat to its second, and the scene took three full days to shoot. You don't have to be an eagle-eyed viewer to spot the knee pads they've got on during the fight, but you might not realize that the ground is covered in painted floor mats. In an interview with Carpenter on the film's DVD, he's asked if he ever considered making the fight scene shorter in the editing room. His response was, and I quote, Fuck no! Speaking of Jeff Amata, nearly any time the camera falls on a close-up of one of the ghouls or shows one talking, that's actually Amata in the costume. If you're not quick, you might miss the guards using the exact same PKE meter that Egon used in Ghostbusters to detect paranormal activity, while the guards here use it to detect alien life. It was also used in Suburban Commando. The film was set to premiere October 21st, 1988, but was pushed to November 4th as to not compete with Halloween 4, which was releasing the same day. That would be the first Halloween film in the franchise that Carpenter had nothing to do with. They Live was shot on a modest $4 million budget and debuted at number one at the box office, earning over $12 million in its very short theatrical run, leaving theaters after just two weeks. The movie has gone on to gain a massive cult following and lives on in pop culture even today. I love so many things about this film. It's pacing, the cinematography, but most importantly, it's message.
They Live is one of my favorite movies. It's as timely as ever, and honestly, just a bucket of fun. If you haven't seen it, grab your sunglasses and buckle up. You talking about John Carpenter movies? <gasps> How did you get in here? Back door is open. You know you directed Halloween? Yes, everyone knows that. You composed it too. Lots of other people know that as well. Can I rent this? No! You don't rent those! Where do these keep coming from? We're closed! We'll be right back. <laughs> Today, it's all about Libra. This is your time to shine. As the seasons change and the leaves turn colors, you are forced to make some big decisions. For some of you, the question will be simple. What do I feed my cats? For others, the decision will be harder. Do I kill my boss or let them live? Whatever the question, you will have the answer. Hold on tight. It's going to be a wild ride. Also, some of you won't make it to the 31st. So get your wills in order, people. And don't forget, everyone, I can read your mind. This fascinating video on psychic powers can be yours free. I'll be back to tell you how. I would never have believed it until one night I woke up around 3 o'clock in the morning. I felt something cold against my shoulder. It was the ceiling. I was looking down at my own body. I was uh, thinking of my childhood friend the other day. I hadn't thought of her for years. Then all of a sudden the phone rings and it's her. Can you tell me that's coincidence? There's a word for it, the paranormal, and it's one of the biggest issues of our age. Now, Time Life Books brings you Mysteries of the Unknown that looks into every area from ESP to precognition to alien encounters to give you all the sides. I'm a scientist. I'm willing to be open-minded, but in my profession, we live by positive proof. My daughter didn't want to get on that school bus. I didn't know why, but something told me to take her seriously. I'm glad I did. Even if just some of these things are real, do you know what that would mean? Here in one place are the newly researched facts, first-person reports, and scientific experiments, so you can decide for yourself. There are so many hints of a world more remarkable than we ever imagined. If you've ever wondered about the unknown, examine your first volume for 10 days free and take a serious look at a world that can no longer be ignored. I never thought I would believe in it until it happened to me. Doug, you gotta keep an eye on the back door. There was a guy up front again. And he had one of those tapes. Where do they keep finding them? I don't have any idea. Look, I apologize. I had the back door propped because I had to get this trash out. And this is heavy. It's almost like there's a dead body in here. No, there isn't. Anyway, speaking of bodies and bags, I found another prime carpenter gem in the Dropbox. You're talking about John Carpenter, right? Yeah. You know he directed Halloween, right? Yeah. You're going to talk about it, right? Yes, at the end. You know he also did the musical score for it? I know! But right now, I'm going to talk about the 1993 anthology classic, Body Bags. That's great. I'm going to take out the trash. Ugh. Ah yes, Body Bags. Released in 1993 as in an original movie by Showtime, this anthology film was initially developed to be a television series that would air on Showtime as their version of cable channel rival HBO's Tales from the Crypt. While Tales from the Crypt used an animatronic puppet created by Kevin Yeager for The Crypt Keeper, Body Bags features Carpenter himself in Rick Baker makeup. And honestly, it's something that absolutely makes the film sing for me, seeing him in that role. But, as Carpenter told the LA Times, this isn't like Tales from the Crypt where it's all tongue-in-cheek. This is a dead serious deal. Whatever you say, Mr. Carpenter. The first segment, The Gas Station, follows Anne, played by Alex Datcher, who is a college student slated to work her first overnight shift at a remote gas station. 
After she introduces herself to the man behind the glass at the gas station, Bill, played by Robert Carradine. You know Robert Carradine from Revenge of the Nerds. He was a nerd. And settles in for her first shift alone. Now, a reason I love this movie is because it's Cameo City. And right off the bat, we've got Nightmare on Elm Street director Wes Craven, who plays a pale, lanky creep. There's also longtime Carpenter players George Buckflower, who appears as a bug-eyed vagrant, and Peter Jason having a night on the town. Incidentally, Flower and Jason also appear in They Live. That's took the hackers months to figure out how to do this. Given the preceding news of the murders around town and the building paranoia, Anne is even suspicious of seemingly nice guy in brown leather Pete. But then Pete drives off without his credit card, Anne runs after him and locks herself out, leaving her exposed. All of this percolating tension comes to a head when a pickup truck mysteriously rises on a hydraulic lift in the adjacent, and supposedly empty, garage. Following in the footsteps of every bad idea in every slasher movie that precedes this one, Anne is compelled to investigate. And that's where the bloodletting begins. First, with the slashed throat of the vagrant in the driver's seat. After making it back inside the booth, Anne calls co-worker Bill for help, but he's revealed to be in the garage bloody machete in hand. Bingo bango, it's never who you think it is. Or maybe it's exactly who you think it is. I mean, seriously, who would have ever suspected the nerd? The following minute, as Bill is advancing towards the booth that's safely housing Anne, is fraught with building tension straight out of Halloween, thanks to the plotting, advancing walk from Carradine, and accompanying score, once again composed by Carpenter himself, beating with anxiety. It all works together extremely well. And as Bill breaks into the booth with a sledgehammer, and that's real glass, people, Anne looks through the employee lockers, only to discover another corpse played by Evil Dead and Spider-Man director Sam Raimi. And Sam Raimi created the Evil Dead series. I love Bruce Cramble. He's again taken down, and a wonderful shot that seems again straight out of the end of Halloween has Anne in the foreground with her back to Bill as he's laying down for the count. That tinging, building carpenter score again ramps up as we see him pop back up, just like Myers did. It's a great scene and a nod to Halloween and Carpenter as a whole. And who would have guessed it? Nice guy and leather Pete came back not only for his credit card, but to save the day. Bill slips on some grease and falls, providing Anne with the opportunity to crush him with the hydraulically lowered truck. And just like that, the story is over without us getting the chance to ask the hard-hitting questions like, how can a person be crushed by a truck with a foot-high clearance? Can blood even spray out of a body like that? And has human blood ever been that color? Alas, these and many other mysteries shall remain unsolved tonight. Forgot my credit card. Interestingly, the gas station signs indicate it's a Mobico, a chain in the greater Carpenterverse whose location in Carpenter's Christine appeared briefly before exploding. More groundbreaking than anything, though, is the character of Anne, played by the stunning Alex Batcher, who quite honestly might be what the website BlackHorrorMovie.com describes as possibly the only example of a black final girl from a slasher film in the 20th century. She has also appeared on an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, but is best remembered for her role alongside Wesley Snipes in Passenger 57. In the second segment, Hair, also directed by Carpenter, Stacy Keach plays Richard, a middle-aged man whose fear of a thinning hairline overwhelms his life while simultaneously irritating his girlfriend played by 80 singer Sheena Easton. So, you think I'm going bald? No, I don't. What's a big deal if you are anyway? Oh, so now I am going bald. That's the most accurate relationship conversation yet committed to film. Everywhere Richard looks, he's reminded of his rapidly thinning hair. Yes, that special effects wizard and director of The Walking Dead and Creepshow series, Greg Nicotero, with a beautiful melon of long locks. Richard tries everything, 
His desperation makes him especially susceptible to a miracle cure commercial he sees, and he finds his way to the clinic of confident, if oddly vague, Dr. Locke, played by David Warner, and his slinky nurse, played by the one and only Debbie Harry. Although the results of the procedure occur overnight, and he enjoys a celebratory romp with his girlfriend, with this new hair, you're just so, you're so, you're so animal. <sighs> Richard finds himself oh. ill the following day. I feel like I'm getting a sore throat. Maybe you overdid it last night, huh? And as the clippings of his first triumphant haircut begin to crawl away, we finally realize what we've suspected all along when something is too good to be true. His new hair is alive. These practical effects of the close-up strains of hair are so well done, thanks to the talented K and B, Kurtzman, Bergman, and Nicotero. Soon, large welts appear all over Richard, with sentient snake-like hair strands growing out of them faster than you can say, Jordy Verrill. I find the scenes of a dejected looking Richard walking with stripes of hair growing out of his face absolutely hilarious. And they sure don't like to be cut. Back at the clinic, all is revealed. The doctor slices Richard's arm open, freeing several of the hair creatures within. Dr. Locke explains these tiny, fragile alien creatures feed on human brains, and they've learned to leverage human vanity about their hair loss to stay well fed through the procedure. Earthlings and your vanity. You're so predictably easy. And then we discovered that your brains are the only food on which we can thrive. The question was one of access. In fact, we're particularly enjoying your brain. We like fat. Even in the universe of the story, this invites a lot of questions. Sure, horror stories are often tales of just desserts, of punishments for moral transgressions, but the price here for vanity seems a little steep. He just wanted some top-of-the-head confidence. Oh well. To quote Gilligan's Island, Season 3, Episode 8, Hair Today, Gone Tomorrow. Now, Carpenter intended to direct all three segments, but he found himself tangled in post-production me, work on In the Mouth of Madness. So, for the final segment, I, it was none other than Toby Hooper of Texas Chainsaw Massacre fame who was brought in. Mark Hamill plays Matthews, a baseball player who's at the top of his game and is driving home after a game one night to his wife, played by Twiggy. A cautionary tale of driving in the rain while reaching for a cassette tape he crashes and winds up with an extremely large chunk of windshield sticking out of his eye. At the hospital, he learns from his doctors, played by two legends, John Ager and Roger freaking Corman, that he's lost his eye. Matthews is devastated, but the doctor tells him not to worry. They can give him an eye transplant, which he agrees to. I think maybe I can help you. Now, after the procedure, for whatever reason, everyone is extremely concerned about his eye colors matching, immediately following an eye transplant. See how this lens fits. And the doctor fits him with a colored contact lens. Now, I'm no doctor. I went to art school and have all of the debt to prove it. But doesn't that just seem like a big bad idea to be slapping a contact lens in your eye immediately following a massive surgery? But hey, what do I know? In a story that feels similar to the 1991 film Body Parts, Hamill starts experiencing headaches and vision flashes of violence. A woman popping out of a grave in his backyard, a bloody arm in the garbage disposal. He's increasingly hostile and bitter with his wife. While in the backyard digging, he even digs up a pair of legs. Now, Hooper's segment is notable for a variety of reasons, including what could be the first and only appearance of Mark Hamill's bare ass in cinematic history. But if I'm wrong about that, please leave a comment and tell me where else I can see it. After continuously scaring his wife, he demands the doctor to tell him where his new peeper came from and is told, well, it came from serial killer John Randall, a serial killer who you guessed it, tried to dispose of his victims in the garbage disposal and buried them in the backyard. 
all of his victims also had blonde hair, which does not bode well for Matthew's wife. It all comes to a head while, in a rage, he ties his wife's hair to the dining room table while reading out of the Bible. The visions keep coming in, and in the climax of the segment, Hamill plunges his garden shares into the eye that's been living rent-free in his head. We go back to the morgue, where we discover that he is not the mortician after all, but actually one of the bodies waiting to be autopsied. As he zips himself back up into a body bag, in walks the real pathologist, for no reason at all, Tom Arnold and Toby Hooper, for the last in a pair of stellar cameos. And that's what I love about this movie. Not only are the cameos spilling out of every scene, but everyone just seems to be having an absolute ball while they were filming this, and it translates right onto the screen with Carpenter himself at the top of it all. You know, these guys crack me up. You gotta love them. Oop, gotta run. It's great to see him in a different change of pace, in front of the camera and directing bite-sized segments instead of a full-run feature. Due to disagreements between Showtime and Carpenter as to where they should film, Showtime wanted Canada for cheaper filming purposes, and Carpenter wanted L.A. due to his ability to get celebrity cameos. Carpenter stuck to his guns, arguing that filming in Los Angeles would be essential for him to land those cameos, and personally, I think that that's what makes the film. So, as oh, such, a TV series never materialized, and what had been the pilot was repackaged as Body Bags, a standalone film that debuted on Showtime in 1993. The script was penned by longtime writing duo Billy Brown and Dan Angel, well suited for anthology storytelling, as they served as the showrunners for the wildly successful Goosebumps TV series, and story editors and writers on The X-Files. Carpenter has said that he was lured to bring body bags to TV rather than cinema by Showtime's initial promise of creative control. What he said, perhaps controversially in 1993, would just be accepted as fact in 2022. The independents are dwindling. The studios control everything. It's all big pictures with stars and huge budgets. So if you want to do submersive filmmaking, you have to go someplace else. And right now, television is that place. All in all, it's a fun little time. As Carpenter said in an interview, Body Bags was simply something that we could do and have a good time with, with the people we like to work with in between doing features. And honestly, isn't that what we should all be doing with our lives? Having a good time? For me, Body Bags is a must-see. I love anthology films, and this one is all the more special because we get to see John Carpenter in the flesh having a great time alongside a massive cast of characters and a truly great plot. The stories are well shot, just as well told, and the fact that he got to collaborate with Toby Hooper on it just makes it all the more special. Oh. Midnight Rental. When are you going to talk about Halloween? Oh my god. After these messages! You flip, but they flop. You flip, but they flop. Now your pancakes are a mess, and all that butter and fat to cook them. There's got to be a better way. Introducing the Perfect Pancake, the world's first spatula-free pancake maker. Perfect Pancake is lightweight, fits easily in one hand, and flips picture-perfect pancakes every time. Just pour in your favorite batter, close the handle, and flip it. Presto, a golden brown pancake with no mess and no added fat. The reason is this double-sided non-stick surface that's so slippery, not even burned on cheese will stick to it. Flip delicious blueberry, fluffy apple cinnamon, or mouth-watering buttermilk flapjacks. Fast, easy, and without ever using a spatula. If you can turn a doorknob, you can use the perfect pancake. Oh no, you broke the yolk again. But watch what happens with the perfect pancake. Three eggs over easy without ever breaking a yolk. Amazing! Now make tasty gingerbread pancakes, fluffy cranberry, or a stack of chocolate chip pancakes for the kids in an instant. You can also prepare fancy French toast, delicious grilled cheese sandwiches, or hearty eggs in a basket with the perfect pancake. 
Plus, cleanup's a breeze. Call now and get the perfect pancake plus this fast and fluffy recipe guide for only $19.95. But wait, there's more. You'll also receive this heart-shaped pancake ring. Make delicious heart-shaped pancakes for your family or friends for a Valentine's treat, a birthday breakfast, or that special anniversary. Yours free. Call in the next 10 minutes and receive this no-drip batter dispenser. Just add your favorite batter, then dispense the perfect amount without the mess every time. Yours free. This incredible offer is all yours for just $19.95, so call now. Call 1-800-306-5200 and order the perfect pancake for just $19.95. You'll make perfect pancakes and delicious eggs without breaking the yolk. This incredible offer won't last, so call 1-800-306-5200 and order now. It's tough to admit you've got hemorrhoids, but knowing what to do about them is easy. Just get what doctors recommend. Preparation H. It helps relieve all these symptoms, and it's formulated to reduce swelling. More people trust Dr. Recommended Preparation H. Hey, hey, everybody. Hey, Carl here, along with Emmy. I just want to let you guys know to check us out over on Patreon. That's right, we're fired up. We're ready for action. We're ready to make more episodes of this great show. But we need your support. Yeah, I'm running low on cat food. Yeah, that's right. Emmy eats cat food. Anyway, it costs a lot to make a show. Join us on Patreon and get exclusive content. Find out all about me. See what's happening with Emmy. Look at Lenora for a while. I don't care. Just check it out. All right, it's that moment that everyone has been waiting for. We know that John Carpenter is synonymous with the 1978 film Halloween, a film infamous for its minimal script, minimal budget, minimal gore, and maximum effect across an entire genre. It is the epitome of less is more, and it is a film that, as minimal as the first one was, has gone on to have a very convoluted history that has spawned many, many storylines. Instead of trying to figure it out by yourself, why don't you sit back, get comfy, and allow me to attempt to explain the very, very tangled history of Halloween. And please be gentle because I'm probably going to get some of this wrong. I'm leaving that in. <laughs> John Carpenter's Halloween released in 1978. What more is there to say about this film? If you've somehow never seen it, just turn me off and go watch it now. It's required viewing. And even if you have never seen it, you at least know the plot, which I'm going to go very quickly over. The film opens in Haddonfield, Illinois, with an eerie point of view that's through the eyes of someone wearing a mask. They stalk and stab to death a girl upstairs in her room. Cut to the point of view, then going outside, where we hear a voice say in surprise, Michael? The mask gets removed, only to reveal the wearer and killer is a small child in a clown suit. It's extremely simple, completely bare bones, and deeply unsettling. Fast forward 15 years when Dr. Sam Loomis, played by Donald Pleasance, is headed to a sanitarium to transport Michael to a court hearing, only to find that he's escaped. Panicked, he tries to warn the town sheriff but he's largely ignored. We meet Laurie Strode, played by Jamie Lee Curtis, who is a high school student, and her friends Linda, PJ Souls, and Annie, Nancy Kyes, excitedly talking about their Halloween plans that evening that involve babysitting. As the evening draws near, it becomes clear that Michael has come back to Haddonfield and he's got plans for the evening as well, except his are a whole bunch of murderin'. While Laurie and Annie are each babysitting, Linda is having a boob of a time and Dr. Loomis is frantically running around Haddonfield trying to find and stop Michael. His efforts are in vain as Michael finds Annie and Linda first and then sets his sights on Lori. It all reaches a boiling point when Lori finds her friends dead and is then trapped in the house with Myers as she tries to save herself and the children. The climax of the film with Lori in the closet, Michael rising back up, and Loomis shooting him from the balcony only to discover that he is gone 
when the movie just ends with no explanation is something that is still as haunting today as the first time I saw it in the third grade when I then proceeded to not sleep for the next five years. I was terrified of the simple white mask that was listed equally as straightforward in the credits as just the shape. It's a simple explanation of the plot because it's a simple story and it simply works. Even in Carpenter's own words, it is what it is. It's a very simple film. Okay, okay, I'll stop saying simple now, but my point is that is why the movie was so successful. There was nary a drop of blood to be seen, and yet the mood it creates with the story it tells stays with you long after the credits have rolled. Your mind fills in the blanks. The cinematography by Dean Cundy is extremely well done, and when paired with Carpenter's bare bones yet evocative score, it's just a perfect recipe that has since long been imitated but never fully replicated. So how did we get from a one-track storyline of a man in a mask returning to his hometown to stalk and kill a few babysitters to, well, I think we're at 11 now? Are we counting the Rob Zombie movies? I'm going to attempt to explain. Here we go. So when the first movie was made, John Carpenter was brought on to direct, write, and compose the film for $10,000. The budget of the film was a little over three hundred k. When the movie debuted and became a huge financial success, bringing in over $70 million, a sequel was demanded from producers and investors. So, three years later, they began shooting Halloween 2. Around the same time, in early 1981, the television rights for Halloween were sold to NBC for a cool $4 million. Despite there being not a drop of blood in the movie, it still had to be edited down for content, and they had to shoot additional scenes to fill the runtime. They did this post-filming Halloween 2 using the same crew. One of the scenes includes a shot of the inside of Michael Cell shortly after he's escaped with the word sister scrawled on the door. Now, this is a crucial bit of information as it would change the course of the story's history and begin the starting point of where the Laurie Strode being Michael's sister actually begins, even though it could have been referencing his older sister that he stabbed in the opening scene of the first movie. In Halloween 2, the plot picks right back up from the original night with Lori being whisked off to a hospital and the remaining majority of the film taking place there. It is revealed to Dr. Loomis that Lori is Michael's youngest biological sister, unbeknownst to her, and now, instead of Michael just being a boogeyman, he now has a clear motive which changes the entire dynamic of the film. Carpenter and Hill never wanted a sequel. They both felt the entire story had been told completely in the first film. But because he was being forced to make a sequel, that meant that he also had to write a script, which he admitted he did with the help of alcohol. While Carpenter trudged through writing a script that he very much did not want to, he was even more vocal that he absolutely did not want to direct the movie. Rick Rosenthal took the reins and was tied to both a script he wasn't jazzed about, along with producers and the studio all wanting their say. The script went through massive amounts of edits, nearly every character developed went through huge transformations, and as a result, left several plot holes with the final product not being anything close to what a new director like Rosenthal wanted. The movie barely features Jamie Lee Curtis, despite how important she was in the first film, and the noticeable wig she has on throughout the movie doesn't do her any favors. To me, the movie feels long and lacks the original punch and tonality of the first film. It's just a movie that exists to be a movie and not much more. The end concludes with Michael getting shot in the eyes and Loomis getting caught in an explosion. From there, we go to Halloween 3, which Carpenter and Hill would return for, but only under the terms that it would not bring back Michael Myers. It would instead be the beginning of an anthology series that would relate to the Halloween holiday. Problems began from the beginning of the script, which passed through three hands. Nigel Neal wrote the initial script. Carpenter and director Tommy Lee Wallace liked the script, but they both wanted some changes and gave feedback, which Neal refused to take. So Carpenter did a rewrite. Then Wallace didn't care for Carpenter's rewrite, so then he did a rewrite. Ah, there's nothing more fun than working on a production with people who can't take notes or set aside their egos. Neil hated the final script so much that he demanded his name be removed from the credits, thus denying him any royalties. 
The story is that Silver Shamrock Industries are making Halloween masks implanted with microchips that are given power through tiny pieces of a rock from Stonehenge that's crushed up. When enacted by an extremely catchy commercial, in four days to Halloween, turn that down. The masks destroy the wearers' heads into snakes and bugs. The plan is to kill millions of children on Halloween night by telling them to put on their masks as they watch the big giveaway broadcast. The founder of Silver Shamrock is, as you would guess, an ancient warlock who wishes to pay tribute to Samhain with the sacrifice of children. It's a completely original idea with no slasher tendencies and doesn't retread the same old story. So, of course, everyone hated it instead of appreciating the unique thriller that it is. How anyone could be displeased with seeing Tom Atkins as Dr. Chalice on screen for an hour and 39 minutes is beyond me. I don't know what the hell is going on. But the people wanted Michael Myers, and he wasn't anywhere near this movie. Unless you count a tongue-in-cheek four-second moment where the original Halloween trailer is being advertised on a TV. Despite earning $14 million with its $2.5 million budget, comparatively speaking to the first two films, it was considered a major negative mark for the series. From here, this is where the Halloween storyline begins to go bananas and starts its strange, unnecessary dabble with the supernatural. Carpenter and Hill ceased their time with Halloween after part three, as did cinematographer Dean Cundy, responsible for the first three film's trademark looks. Halloween four and five featured Jamie, played by the amazingly talented Daniel Harris, who is Laurie Strode's daughter. Part four kills off Laurie Strode in the beginning, revealing that she died in a car accident. Jamie is now being stalked by Michael. She lives with her foster family, and her foster sister Rachel Carruthers, played by the plucky Ellie Cornell, is one of my favorite final girls. Part four for me is the last Halloween film in the franchise that retains even a small amount of mood and scare from the first one. And to this day, it's still an enjoyable film to rewatch thanks to its script. The end of part five introduces the man in black with the thorn symbol that matches Michael's tattoo and its Swiss cheese storyline full of holes. This sets the stage for things to go off the rails in part six, which is such a confusing film that not even two completely different endings or Paul Rudd could save it. I'm out of here! Tommy, where is he? It worked. Power of the runes stopped him. Donald Pleasance sadly passed away during filming, seemingly taking any of Dr. Loomis's logic left with him. H2O brought a fresh start to the series, completely ignoring all of the previous films after part two. It also brought back Jamie Lee Curtis. Made for the Scream era, it's a fast-paced, slick film that fit right in with its time, and in my opinion, was light years better than part six that preceded it. A new start was needed to eradicate the cult of Thorn, which frankly made no sense. Plus, Jamie Lee Curtis's mother, Janet Lee, was in it. Oh, oh Miss Tate, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I didn't mean to make you jump. It's okay. Well, hey, it's Halloween. I guess everyone's entitled to one good scare. I've had my share. As was Adam Arkin from Full Moon High. Holy shit. All right. Pee on me and let's call it a night, okay? Given all the previous films, it sure could have been a hell of a lot worse. It's your game now, Dr. Loomis. Then we move to 2002's Halloween Resurrection, which could have also been titled One Step Forward, 167 Steps Back. It now had Laurie Strode in a mental institution and Myers kills her in the first 10 minutes. She has more dialogue in Resurrection than she did in Halloween 2. However, the rest of Resurrection just has Buster Rhymes, Tyra Banks, and is set in a house fitted with cameras as a webcam reality series. But truthfully, I'd rather watch the Las Vegas Hello, season Michael. of the real world hey, than sit this right there. there. Let the danger begin. After that, the series was essentially dead, 
unless you count Rob Zombie's two Halloween interpretations from 2007 and 2009. But honestly, I consider those completely separate from the franchise and as their own standalone movies. This brings us to now, beginning with the 2018 requels, Halloween, Halloween Kills, and the most recent Halloween Ends, which again, wipe away the Etch-A-Sketch screen and start right back after Halloween 2 ends. We've got Jamie Lee Curtis yet again back in the stab saddle, though Halloween Kills barely features her at all, much like the original Halloween 2. It's basically become an a la carte choose-your-own-timeline warp zone to stick to, and if a visual representation helps cement this, there you go. The requels have been fun and filled with Easter egg nods to the original films. And truthfully, I'm happy horror movie franchise pulses are still beating, even if they don't make sense. If they can make this many Marvel movies about the same explosions and the same good versus evil plots, then they can keep doing it here, replacing the explosions with stabs. While the most recent film, Halloween Ends, claims to really be the end, you and I both know it's really Halloween Ends for now. Because as long as there's money to be made, there will always be a producer waiting to bring Michael back. They've killed both Myers and Laurie Strode multiple times, and here we are. Myself and countless other fans are still back at the theater each opening night to see how they'll rewrite history this time. It's been wild to see such a minimal, simple film come this far and have this many outrageous storylines. And the reason I always return to the first one is because it never disappoints. That credit goes to John Carpenter, Deborah Hill, Jamie Lee Curtis, Donald Pleasance, and everyone else. So, if you're still here, did you get all of that? I hope so, because I'm not explaining it again. Hey, take a look at these ads! A double pleasure's waiting for you. A double pleasure from Double Mint Gum. A double great feeling, making you realize Double is the one for you. Double fresh, double smooth. I'm a performer. My hair has to look great all the time, so I use White Rain Shampoo and Conditioner. Louise Vandrell. They leave my hair as clean and silky as a fancy brand, without the fancy price. White Rain, beautiful hair at a beautiful price. She's music to your ears. Share a slice of life with Lucy. Then, Ellen meets her favorite author. Nobody could ever have as many drinks or as many lovers as Natalie is supposed to have had. Speak for yourself, darling. The Ellen Burstyn Show. Saturday. Did you know this movie was shot in Boston? Mmm. I'm getting a vision. That's not right. I'm going to call my L.A. location scout buddy. He knows where everything was made. Hello? Uh, yes, this is Los Angeles. Who is this? Um, well, my name is Nick Carr. I am a movie location scout, and uh, you might know my work from such movies as Wolf of Wall Street, uh, the upcoming Joker sequel, and uh, Spider-Man 3 with Tobey Maguire. You know, the good one. Uh, how can I help you guys today? We're having a dispute about where this was filmed. Can you help us out? Well, I regret to inform you, sir, that you are 100% wrong. Uh, not a single frame of this movie was shot in Illinois. In fact, the whole thing was shot right here in the Los Angeles area. And the dead giveaway to that are the trees. Look at the trees in the background of virtually all of the shots. You will see they are very much green and in bloom. However, if you look at the ground, you'll see a smattering of 30 or 40 leaves. In fact, if you pay closer attention, you may see that these 30 or 40 leaves get used over and over again. Obviously put there by the set dressers on the movie to make it feel a little bit like autumn. Exactly what trees these leaves are falling from is very unclear, but no, I'm sorry to say this was 100% shot right here in Los Angeles. No, I'm telling you this is the case. In fact, uh, do you want to see the locations? We could go take a look right now. I think this phone cord is long enough. You want to go? All right, let's go. 
So we're gonna start today by going to one of my favorite filming locations in movie history, this hedge. Okay, it's pretty much the dream of every location scout to find that one movie location that becomes so famous, so iconic, that people go visit it in person year after year, decade after decade. The townhouse from Sex in the City, the apartment building from Friends. But this, this one is special to me because it's just a hedge. And it goes to show that it's not just the location, but how you use it. And John Carpenter used it for a moment that was truly unique for horror movies. At just 23 minutes into the movie, the monster steps out from behind this hedge in full view in broad daylight for anyone to see him. It's just for a moment, but it was such a startling departure from most horror movies where the monster is hidden till at least the halfway mark. Again, it's just a hedge, but people haven't stopped coming to visit it in person for over 40 years. This hedge is located in South Pasadena, which is where most of the Halloween filming locations were. Let's take a look at some of the others. The most famous location in town is, of course, the Michael Myers childhood home. At the time of filming, the house was in a state of serious dilapidation, and all crew members were called upon to help restore it in time to play as the film's opening location. You're not supposed to go up there. Yes, I am. Back then, it was also located a block away from its current address. In 1987, it was slated for demolition and only narrowly avoided the wrecking ball at the last minute when it was moved to its present location. At literally any time of day or night, you can find Halloween fans taking pictures and posing out front. The locals have embraced it too. Here, the gallery just behind it is gearing up for this year's Haddonfield exhibition. The next location is pretty easy to find. Just turn 180 degrees from the Myers house and you'll find yourself in downtown Haddonfield. The hardware store from the film is located right on the corner. Hi, Annie. Lori. What happened? Oh, uh, somebody broke into the hardware store. Probably kids. Today, it's a bakery. A few minutes away from the hardware store is Lori Strode's house. The present owner is very welcoming of Halloween fans and has even set out some pumpkins so you can recreate Lori's forlorn pose on the concrete stoop. And last but not least, Lori's high school exteriors were shot at South Pasadena High School. Man, I can't get over how long this phone cord is. Anyway, uh, not all the locations in Halloween were shot in South Pasadena. In fact, one very important location was shot right here at the Hollywood Reservoir. And I know what you're thinking, when was a reservoir in the movie Halloween? Well, the reservoir wasn't, but the front gate was. In the movie, Dr. Loomis and a nurse approach the Warren County Sanitarium to pick up Michael Myers, only to find the patients have somehow broken out. This was shot at the northern gate to the reservoir. Why? I'm not 100% sure, but one possibility, it was cheap. City-owned properties are almost always more affordable to shoot at than private, and when all you need is a gate, how could you do better? From here, we're gonna head about 15 minutes south into Hollywood to take a look at our last two locations. The Doyle House, where Lori Strode babysits on Halloween night, and the Wallace home where her friend Linda babysits. This street, North Orange Grove Avenue, was chosen because both the trees and architecture don't scream Southern California. I love that the geography makes sense. The houses are located on opposite sides of the block, about three or four homes down from each other. Over the years, there have been a bunch of changes made to the Wallace home, but the Doyle house looks more or less the same. To this day, Hollywood tour vans come through literally every 15 minutes to see where Michael Myers' Reign of Terror was filmed over 40 years ago. All right, well, I, uh, I hope that answers all your questions about where Halloween was actually filmed here in Los Angeles. Uh, there's a long line of people waiting to use this phone, which is really weird. Uh, so I should probably get off the line. Uh, but if you ever have any future questions about uh, locations, location scouting, or anything to do with LA, just give us a call, because we'll answer the phone. All right, talk to you guys later. This is not going to be a recurring segment, but it is just going to be something that I show tonight because it is something that I have noticed since I was very young and I've always thought it was weird. Have you ever watched the Vianetta commercial? If you haven't, here it is. Briars has created a spectacular ice cream dessert called Vianetta. But despite its delicious premium ice cream with its irresistible crisp chocolatey layers, Vianetta could leave you with one small problem.
Vianetta from Briars. One slice is never enough. Now, I don't know if you're a complete weirdo like myself, but that commercial was completely fraught with extreme sexual tension. The building saxophone, the hand wringing of the napkin, the finger rimming the bowl. I mean, what is everyone so boned up about this ice cream for? Fionette is delicious. I love it. I was too sad when it went away in the mid 2000s. But what the hell is going on with that commercial? Yeah, it's a loaf of ice cream. Did you want to do any sexy stuff with it? Yes, get sexy with it. How do you get s They already did- I can't get any sexier than that commercial. You guys all saw that. <laughs> and so, here we are at the end of yet another evening here at Midnight Rental. There will never be enough time to talk about all of the John Carpenter movies that I love, but I love the man so much, maybe we'll do a part two someday. He is an immensely talented living treasure that we just don't deserve. He's the only JC that I need. So, bid yourselves a farewell, have a great night, and remember... Good night. Stop it now, turn it off, turn it off, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it! Sit, Ubu, sit. Good dog.